Good afternoon. We would like to welcome you to the Con Edison Commercial and Industrial Program Market Partner Webinar. My name is Lauren Blackwood, and I'm your host today. I work with Lockheed Martin as the Regional Marketing and Outreach Lead. Today, I am pleased to introduce two individuals who are here to conduct this webinar presentation. Our first speaker today is Chuck McKinney. He is the Vice President of Sales and Marketing for AirQuity. Mr. McKinney has spent 30 years in a wide variety of sales and marketing roles in both technology and energy efficiency businesses. For the past five years, he has led AirQuity's marketing effort, raising awareness of airside efficiency opportunities for university, health care, life science, and commercial office clients, helping to grow the company's business to more than 500 customers worldwide, including Apple, MIT, Penn, Eli Lilly, and the Durst Organization. Mr. McKinney also volunteers his time with professional organizations serving on the board of the local chapter of the International Institute for Sustainable Labs. Our second speaker today is Stephen Campbell. Stephen serves as the Energy Advisor for the Lockheed Martin Energy Solutions, which implements the Con Edison Commercial and Industrial Program and also the New Demand Management Program. Stephen specializes in outreach to the healthcare, university, and hospitality sectors, working with facility operators, property managers, building owners, and technology professionals to achieve energy savings. We ask that you please submit any questions you may have via the Q&A area in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, and we will answer those questions at the end of the session. We ask that you please submit any questions to all of the presenters and the hosts. If you have any technical issues, please send your questions directly to me or call 866-229-3239 for support. At this time, I would like to hand over the presentation to Chuck. Thanks, Lauren, and good afternoon, everyone. Greetings from snowy Massachusetts, uh, where our headquarters are located just outside of Boston. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you this afternoon about airside efficiency, what it is, and how it can impact your energy efficiency and climate action plan. Now, I don't need to tell anyone in this audience that energy has been a focus for a long time. Um, I can go back 40 years in terms of uh, discussions about uh, energy efficiency in, in general, but the increasing awareness about climate change has led to more and more discussions and establishment of carbon reduction goals. Utility incentives have certainly been a big part of uh, trying to fuel energy efficiency programs of late, which is why we're here this afternoon. And federal programs, federal, state, and local programs have all worked to encourage and in some cases mandate uh, uh, increasing energy efficiency in buildings. To be sure, uh, Mayor de Blasio has uh, raised the bar with his declaration that the city will work to reduce its greenhouse gases by 80% by the year 2050, building on his predecessor's goals and making very specific reference to the fact that energy efficiency from buildings will fuel this uh, achievement of this goal, uh, not just uh, you know, the use of alternative fuel types. Uh, Mayor de Blasio has, is definitely on the right track, in our opinion, because according to the Department of Energy, 60% of all energy used in North America comes from the energy associated with operating buildings, half of that in commercial buildings. If you think about the energy consumption within a single commercial building, HVAC represents more than a third of the energy consumption of that facility. This puts it on par, sometimes even slightly ahead of lighting, making it a very important aspect of any energy efficiency program. Now, some people may, may be surprised, may not be surprised that HVAC is 3% or slightly more in a, in a commercial office building. Um, but in a critical environment, in a lab or a research building that uses 100% outside air with no recirculation, HVAC is double that in terms of energy consumption, occupying between 50 and 70% of the energy uh, used in those facilities. 
Now, just the, the fact that it occupies a big portion of the pie of energy consumption doesn't necessarily make it an opportunity if, in fact, that energy was needed to maintain the comfort of the facility. But the fact of the matter is, the vast majority of commercial buildings are overventilated. They reach that state through a variety of reasons, which I will not spend much time talking about this afternoon. We'll talk about the fix, not necessarily the exact how we got there. This overventilation, though, is an opportunity because there is a lot of needless energy use going on in buildings. And to put a finer point on airside efficiency, I'd like to just point out the difference uh, between airside efficiency and, and sort of making your equipment more, more efficient in general. If you discovered that your refrigerator was open all the time, you might try and lower your energy bill by buying a more energy efficient refrigerator. You might save a little bit of energy. But just like an airside, you really need to fix the waste. And in these buildings, the waste is all of the extra air that is flowing through buildings needlessly. So what air side efficiency is all about is optimizing the amount of air in a building. It could be the air placed specifically within different spaces at different times based on their conditions. It can also be amount, the amount of outside air being provided into these systems because there's a tremendous amount of energy required to condition that air for those indoor conditions. Where is airside efficiency applicable? We generally divide uh, all of our facility spaces into two different categories. Spaces that use 100% outside air without circulation, those would be science, lab, some healthcare research facilities, and facilities that have variable occupancy uh, and recirculating systems. We looked at a university campus those two definitions would account for about 60%, sometimes 70% of the building stock uh, on a typical campus. In science, life science facilities that use 100% outside air, savings of nearly 60% can be achieved by deploying airside efficiency. In student unions, auditorium, libraries, 20 to 30% savings is easily achievable and in classroom facilities, on an obvious variable occupancy based on whether or not class is in session, 20% uh, reductions in energy can be achieved. Hospitals and healthcare organizations are also great applications for airside efficiency. Lobbies, operating rooms, cafeterias, labs and research areas, animal research facilities that may be associated with those healthcare facilities, even administrative offices have a combination of either recirculating or 100% outside air systems, and each of them are wonderful candidates for airside efficiency. So airside efficiency, as I define it, has been known by a different name for quite some time, often referred to as demand control ventilation. Let me describe briefly how demand control ventilation works, and then we'll talk a little bit about how air acuity approaches the uh, shortcomings of traditional or conventional demand control ventilation. In order to provide the right amount of air to any given space, you first need to know what's going on in that space. So you need to measure the parameters in the air. In a commercial structure, that would typically be measuring the amount of CO2 and possibly humidity in that space. In a laboratory, we want to measure more than just CO2 and humidity, however. We want to measure particulates, we want to measure TVOCs, which stands for total volatile organic compounds, things that are in that air that make it less pleasant, less productive, less comfortable, and sometimes less safe. Depending on the results of those measurements, you will determine whether the space is over or underventilated. We've all been in a building that's gone and walked into a conference room that's empty and cold because it's overventilated. But because there's no measurement going on, it quickly becomes hot and stuffy after a fairly short period of time. That's a very simple analogy of how measuring and then using that, that data to respond would take, would take hold. In a laboratory, the exact same analogy holds. In a lab where there is little to no activity, there will be no airborne contaminants found in this space, and air change rates will be held low. When there is activity, 
and airborne contaminants are detected, air change rates are raised, thereby keeping the, the area safe and comfortable. So after we've measured these parameters and determined over or under ventilation, we'll inform building control systems already in place to raise or lower the ventilation, we'll monitor the response, and then we'll continue on the cycle 24 hours a day, seven days a week, providing the right amount of ventilation for the conditions at any given time. Now, conventional approaches to domain control ventilation have been problematic. These approaches have been around for a long period of time, but they center on the accuracy and reliability of the sensors. While sensor technology has improved over the years, the primary focus and enhancements of those sensors have been to make them smaller, less expensive, perhaps even wireless. The actual sensing technology itself has not improved dramatically for many, many years. Unfortunately, this has a very significant impact for domain control ventilation. These sensors, when they become inaccurate, and they can be inaccurate as in as short a time as six months, will start to overstate, typically, the amount of contaminants in the air, and therefore they will directly lead to lost energy savings doing exactly the opposite of what they were intended to do. Now, these sensors can be maintained and often replaced after a couple of years, but the life cycle cost of maintaining the, a vast number of discrete sensors greatly diminishes the benefit of the energy efficiency initiative that they were installed to implement. When you combine the fact that you need sensors for many different parameters in laboratories, the high first cost of putting a lot of sensors in all of these spaces uh, makes for a very difficult implementation. Finally, even though all of these sensors are collecting a tremendous amount of data, it's very difficult to use to turn that ocean of data into actionable information. And for all these reasons, facility managers tend to shy away, oftentimes installing CO2 sensors and later disconnecting them from control. Fertility takes the overall principles of domain control ventilation and reverses the architecture to overcome the shortcomings of sensors. In this relatively crude uh, illustration, I'd just like to point out that instead of putting sensors in every room, and here I have illustrated I want, I want to measure what's in the supply air. I want to measure what's going on in the federal laboratories. I want to measure what's going on in the classroom. I'm not putting sensors in those spaces. What I'm doing is I'm actually putting a port, and I'm going to grab and transport an air sample from each of these spaces. I'm going to multiplex that air sample across the network and transport it to a centrally located sensor suite that will hold one to as many as five different Sensors. As I animate this to show these magical cups of air moving down this network, you can think of it just like a data network that multiplexes data, but instead of multiplexing data, we are multiplexing air samples down a single conduit. After the sensor suite determines the contaminants in the air, it communicates through an information management server, both to the building control system and through our data center which applies analytics and, and gets this information back into a usable form to facility managers, energy managers, even environmental health and safety personnel. Because we are using very, a very few number of sensors for a large number of areas, we're able to implement a service strategy that calibrates, refurbishes, and in some cases replaces sensors over time the lifetime of the installation, ensuring that each installation is always measuring and reporting what's going on in the space accurately. We also take this information with our airside expertise, provide specific analytics to help energy managers determine whether or not they are saving the energy they intended, to help building facility managers identify over and under ventilated spaces, 
and to help environmental health and safety personnel identify areas where lab safety protocols may or may not be followed appropriately. Results of deploying domain control ventilation in a lab are very significant. In most general labs, solution air change rates often run as high as 8 to 10 air changes per hour. Deploying air acuity can reduce those air change rates on average to as low as 4 air changes during occupied hours and 2 air changes during unoccupied hours. In a lab research environment that requires animals, Bivarias often require air change rates as high as 15 to 25 uh, air changes an hour. Implementing air acuity can reduce these numbers dramatically down to as low as four to eight air changes uh, per hour. Air acuity technology has been around since 2007, and we've got a vast number of clients and case studies um, that have proven how our solution works. I'd like to highlight just a few of them. In 2008, the University of Pennsylvania implemented their acuity in both a vivarium and a wet lab and studied those installations for an entire calendar year, comparing them against other energy conservation measures uh, that they were attempting to deploy at the time. What they discovered was of the 30 different energy conservation measures they were implementing at the time, air acuity was the number one thing that they could do on their campus to reduce energy. As a result, they began implementing air acuity campus-wide, completing 15 projects to date with many more projects in the design phase as we speak. The results to date have been fairly significant. Average return on investment of those installations is under two years. They've exceeded five and a half million KWH in savings, nearly 800,000 therms, and just under $2 million per year in energy savings. Here in Boston, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center uh, occupies the six floors of a building that they lease. Biomedical uh, Realty Group. Uh, as the tenant, they are responsible for the utility bill, uh, so they saw this was in their best interest to uh, perform an energy retrofit, even though it required a capital upgrade. Acuity moved, to the, moved this energy retrofit forward across six floors, in the end saving the IDMC $640,000 annually in energy costs. And after the utility incentive was applied to the project, the return on investment was less than one year. This project was so successful that it was recognized by the Association of Energy Engineers as the best research facility energy project in New England two years ago. Arizona State, another large client of Air Cutie, uh, serves as another example of how Air Cutie can be applied even to relatively new buildings. Uh, and making them even more efficient. Uh, the Biodesign Institute was a new construction project opened in uh, late 2005. It was recognized as the lab of the year in 2006. And it received LEED certification gold and platinum down its two research wings uh, when its construction was complete. Acuity came in a year later and was first piloted and then installed throughout both research rings uh, as an energy retrofit. And we reduced the utility costs in that facility alone by approximately a million dollars. This led to a widespread deployment of air acuity across Arizona State's campus uh, via their ESCO contract. Uh, we are currently in uh, 24 facilities uh, throughout that campus. Uh, the University of California, Irvine, is a research-intensive university that, in my opinion, sets the benchmark for lab efficiency. They have uh, taken on a partnership with the Department of Energy Better Buildings Challenge, which established a goal of reducing their energy consumption by 20% by the year 2020. 
UC Irvine attacked this problem in a very systematic way, uh, experimenting with a lot of different energy conservation measures that could be deployed either in new construction projects, in energy retrofit projects, or both. And they developed a formula that they now refer to as smart labs, where they can show consistently uh, energy reductions of 50% or more in either new construction or existing facilities. As a result of deploying their smart lab in 15 of their 17 lab buildings to date, they've successfully exceeded the Better Buildings Challenge. There are a 23% energy reduction six years ahead of schedule. Last spring, they were recognized at the White House for this achievement and immediately reset their goal. And now looking to achieve a 40% reduction of energy by the year 2020. Security is a proud partner with UC Irvine as our airside efficiency program, a foundation of the smart lab, producing approximately 50% of the savings to UC Irvine's smart lab program. Close to home in New York City, their community has been deployed in 20 projects across 12 different property owners in all sorts of different building types. Universities, pharmaceuticals, K-12 schools, government buildings, and commercial office buildings. We're currently working on a very large lab building project. But unfortunately, I'm not allowed to disclose the clients as the um, project is still in this Final design phase is about to is about to go out to bid um, for implementation. Uh, but this building is about 10 years old, has an existing variable air volume system, um, but is in need of a controls upgrade. So this project will entail both the installation of air security and an upgrade to the control system. Uh, we have evaluated the space and determined that there's approximately 130,000 square feet of lab by varying space uh, that we can uh, apply air side efficiency techniques to. That equates to approximately 200 different lab zones and 150 by varying spaces. Those air change rates will be reduced from an average of nine air change rates in the labs to approximately four air changes. And in the Vivaria, we're looking at reducing a current average of 17 air change rate, uh, air changes an hour down to eight. Our estimation is that this project will reduce the overall flows in that building at just over 150,000 CFM. The resulting energy savings will be well over 6 million kWh and over 360,000 therms. Even with the building controls upgrades that are necessary uh, to make this building work properly, uh, the simple payback is being calculated for less than two years. Now, Lauren did mention I'm a marketing guy. I could probably tell you stories all day about, uh, about customers. We do have a fairly limited time. So I won't uh, talk about all of the customers that we do have well, well over 500 customers now around the world in all sorts of different um, marketplaces, all sorts of different geographies, all sorts of different climates. I will, however, point you to a couple of links on our website. You don't have to scramble to write these down as uh, we will be posting the, the presentation and you can follow these uh, publicly. Um, but there is a uh, there's a lot more information that can be had on our website uh, to learn both about our clients and about uh, how to implement air side efficiency across the portfolio of buildings. And with that, I'll pass it back to uh, Lauren and Stephen.
Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as Warren stated, my name is Stephen Campbell. I'm an energy advisor with Lockheed Martin for the kind of this in commercial industrial program, as, long as, as well as their demand management program. So I'm going to speak a little bit about the CNI program as well as, well as the DMP program and what it takes to be eligible for both of them. So for both the CNI and the DMP program, no equipment is to be removed or disconnected or installed until after a technical review um, and or a pre-installation inspection is taken care of. Um, that is very important to understand because if either one happens before, um, you know, installation does begin, uh, the project will be uh, disqualified for any kind of expenses. The kind of customer um, of record needs to pay into the MAC um, charge or the SBC charge. Um, pure NIPA customers are not eligible for this program, and on both programs, the incentives will be capped at 50% of the project cost, um, plus there will be additional bonuses if they are eligible on meeting certain requirements for that. For just the DMP program, the projects or portfolios must have a great, like a combined peak demand reduction of 50 kW or greater, which is different from the CNI program, which is the KWH program. The project for the DMP program must be installed and operational by June 1st of 2016, and until we hear something different, that's the, the date that's set in stone. Uh, there must be a peak demand reduction, meaning that the, during the week in the summer, uh, the energy is mostly used between 2 and 6 p.m. On the DMP program, unlike the CNI program, projects do not need to pass the TRC testing, which stands for the Total Resource Cost Testing, uh, which basically lets a uh, project lets you know whether a project passes or fails to get an incentive. So as long as you're using Energy Star or DLC rated products for the DMP program, you should be good and you don't have to worry about passing the TRC. And unlike CNI, the CNI program, uh, the DMP program does have measurement and verification required MNV, where they will um, set up an MNV plan for each project and to be able to actually uh, measure the actual usage for each uh, project. So these are some DMP key projects and incentives. Um, this is obviously what everyone is mostly interested about. The DMP program itself has a lot bigger incentives than the CNI program. So as you can see here, um, you know, some of the, some of the incentives. Um, we highlighted the HVAC controls processes incentives. Um, which is a $1,250 incentive. What's great about the DMP program as well is that you can actually piggyback off the CNI program and get any KWH savings um, incentives that are available there as well. Um, you can see at the bottom that projects over a 500 KW will receive an additional 10% of the KW incentive, and anything over a 1 megawatt will receive a 15% of the KW incentive as well. Um, I'm just going to take a little bit of time while I have it to just talk a little bit about the CNI program and some kind of the, some of the benefits that may be available to some of the customers. Um, so some of the things that we have uh, that we like to uh, talk about is that we do have a simple submittal and review process. Um, also, you do have a single point of contact. Um, these customers assigned an energy advisor, uh, like myself, that can personally handle all projects from start to beginning and answer any questions that you have along the way. We do give out our exact tool, which allows either the market partner or the customer to actually put in the scope of work into the tool to see if they will get an incentive or not to each project. Uh, so that's something that we, we give out and we let you guys use yourselves as well. Um, we would like to think that we have a pretty quick prompt payment process. Um, we usually like to say that after the post inspection is completed and there's no other issues, that you will receive the check within four to six weeks. Um, one of the most recent program updates is that the incentive payment can be either uh, made out to the customer or the customer's contract, um, excuse me, contractor, um, and obviously we, we need some kind of letter of authorization for that. Um, like I stated before, we do not have any kind of m and for the CNI program, and one of the benefits that, um, that a lot of people try to take advantage of is that we have an extensive market partner network within the CNI program, which lists, you know, basically hundreds of different contractors, architects, engineers, energy consultants that you can get in contact for a particular project. To date, um, we have more than 2,500 projects that we have completed. Um, we have over 5,300 uh, applications that we have received, and we've given out an excess of $30 million in rebate money. Um, right now, we have more than 1,500 market partners involved in the program, 
So if there is an opportunity to look for a certain contractor for a particular job, you shouldn't have a problem getting anyone for that. Um, some of the incentives that we do have, we do have, um, we do break the program down into three groups, uh, the prescriptive or rebate program, the custom program, or the energy efficiency study program. The rebate and prescriptive program is just a program that already has pre-approved measures within it, um, anywhere from going from a, T, a T12 to a T8, um, would get a certain amount of money. Um, if you're just putting in LED A lamps, that'll be, that'll be eligible for a certain amount of money. So they, they get a flat rate of money. Where in the custom program, it's performance-based incentives. So there is a new incentive that just recently came out where all uh, incentives, especially on the lighting side, um, will receive a 15 cent KWH savings uh, over an annual year of savings. And any gas project is eligible for one to two dollars a therm projected in the first year of savings. Um, potential suggestions for custom projects include chiller or refrigeration system upgrades, elevator modernization, window film, um, or any other qualified equipment that saves energy. So if you do have a particular project that's not on the rebate or prescriptive side of things, we will look at it in, a custom, uh, in the custom program. We also have our energy efficiency study program, which is a co-funded technical study to evaluate energy used in a facility. And basically we can re um, incentivize 50% of the study um, up to fifty thousand dollars for gas or electric, but if you're going to do a gas and electric study, we can rebate up to fifty percent of sixty-seven thousand dollars for that study. So, how do we calculate a DMP incentive? Great. So, you take the KWH that you're saving on that particular project, and you times it by sixteen cents on that particular side of things. The TRC is applied. And then you add that to the KW times the $1,250 per KW that you're saving, which there is no TRT, and that's what your incentive should be for that particular project. Um, obviously, we do have, when the MNV does come in to uh, focus for the DMP portion of it, you know, there, there could be some slight changes in it, but, you know, hopefully that doesn't happen. Um, every incentive, like I said before, is capped at the 50% of the total project cost. And as you can see here from a large lab customer that Air Curity did, um, there was a project that consisted of a thir over 1,300 KW savings, uh, 6 million KWH savings, and a uh, over a $2 million incentive. Um, so, and this project is eligible for that 50% KW bonus, which is, uh, which is definitely um, nice to see when you're getting your offer letter back to you. Very good. Well, I just want to say thank you so much to Steve and Chuck for conducting today's presentation. At this time, I'm going to offer the opportunity for everyone to submit questions and comments. Um, you can submit your questions in the lower right-hand corner of the screen. Um, and I guess we could wait a couple minutes or seconds to see if we have any coming through. Okay, well, I do not believe we have any questions coming through at this time. Um, again, Steve and Chuck, thanks so much for doing this. I did want to reinforce that we will be sending out today's presentation via email shortly. Um, contact information for Chuck and for Stephen is on the screen right now. And we thank you for participating today, and we look forward to working with you on your future projects.